Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. And who is he? Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. And who is he? Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. And what he do? And he's gonna react to all the self snitching. Oh. Hi, this is Bruce Rivers. Welcome to another fun-filled episode of Criminal Lawyer Reacts. I'm Bruce Rivers, board-certified criminal defense lawyer. Today's episode is brought to you by eForms.com. That's eForms.com. If you need a power of attorney, you need a loan agreement, you need any kind of form, eviction form, any anything where you want to do some legal work on your own, go to eForms.com. They are amazing. Sometimes even a practitioner like me will go there so I don't have to reinvent the wheel. So go to eforms.com so you don't have to hire a guy like me. So we're reacting today to the news that Amber Heard has reassembled a team of lawyers. So if you remember in Amber Heard's trial, she was represented primarily by Rattenborn and Elaine, right? Well, she's ditched Elaine and now she's got Rottenborn and she's got J. Ward Brown and David L. Axelrod. That's her new pellet team. And if David Axelrod and Jay Brown are most famous for representing the New York Times when they were sued by Palin and they successfully defended that suit. So, and basically, you know, they're First Amendment guys. And I think that First Amendment is a little, you know, Ben Rattenborn had argued about the First Amendment during the trial, if you remember. And it's interesting that Elaine is now out. Here's the thing. That often happens because what you have to do when you have an appeal is find what the errors were in the trial, okay? And so I guarantee you one of the things they're going to do on appeal is they're going to go after Elaine for ineffective assistance of counsel. I would be shocked if they didn't do that. She, There were so many times where she just threw her hands up and, and she just got her ass handed to her, if we remember. And so... The other thing is the First Amendment issue that, you know, her that Amber Heard's uh, activities were somehow protected by the First Amendment. I just don't see that happening because if you remember what the First Amendment is, is the right to free speech, right? But you don't have the right to any free speech. If what you're saying is false and you're defaming somebody, you don't you don't have the right to just say what you want to say whenever you want to say it. You know, there are complications when – or uh, consequences for yelling fire in a crowded theater for example or if you defame somebody and they're actually hurt by your words so it'll be interesting to see exactly what's going to happen with this appeal but they have to do a couple things they first they file a notice of appeal which they've done then they have they get the transcript of the trial and it's a six-week trial so that's going to be a lot of things to go through and then not only do they have to do that they have to assign some kind of fundamental error. And if you look at the some of the post-verdict motions, we can kind of glean what they're going to do because the, the juror issue will probably be an issue on appeal. The, uh, the judge's rulings about keeping evidence out will be an issue on appeal. I guarantee you Elaine's performance will be under scrutiny. Uh, that'll be an issue for appeal. The First Amendment, I just don't see it. I just don't see that she's got a First Amendment issue. You know, the First Amendment, you know, really talks about government action. You know, that's your, your constitutional rights are protected from government action. So, for example, the Fourth Amendment right to against search and seizure, well, you don't have a Fourth Amendment right, you know, against having your neighbor come in. It's really against the government coming in without a warrant because your, your neighbor couldn't. That's just called burglary. That's just a totally different animal. But the First Amendment, you protect speech from an intrusion or a restriction by the government, not necessarily by another party. So the addition of these new lawyers to the team is, I think, a, a stroke of luck and maybe genius on Amber Heard's part. But who's paying her bill? I mean, honestly, if it's not being paid by insurance, which it probably isn't, who's paying her bill? Some other wealthy benefactor? Very, very possible. But I don't care how good her lawyers are, her lawyers aren't going to be able to change the facts. And no matter what happens, they're limited to what happened during the trial and, and pre-trial, but just things that happen inside the courtroom. You can't raise anything anything new that hasn't been presented in the courtroom. I can't imagine with all the things that, that was going on, 
that she's going to be able to come up with any kind of new evidence because if it was available at the time, you're stuck. So I think it's going to be, you know, the, the issues that I talked about, and it's going to be issues related to representation because I, I, Elaine just didn't seem like she was up to the job, quite honestly. So now, as I said, your appeal is so different from what, what happens at trial. You have to, have, first of all, you're very limited in, in the time you get to argue. You only get like 15 minutes aside. Second of all, you have to have a, uh, th- you got to present a brief, and that, that has to follow certain rules. When you when you look at what Amber Heard's lawyer, Elaine, which she did during the trial, none of that crap would fly in a, at the Court of Appeals. And you, you don't have that much time. You know, you can reserve a little bit for rebuttal, but you don't have that much time to argue your case. And in fact, the judges kind of have their, once they read the brief, they kind of have an idea of where they're going to, how they're going to decide the case. And you can tell where they're going with their, with your argument when they question you. Because here's what happens. You get up and you start arguing your case, right? And then They'll interrupt you, and you hope they interrupt you because you want to know what the judges are thinking. And it's a three-judge panel, and so you sit there and you start your argument, and as you're starting to argue, they'll, well, counsel, isn't it true that Elaine was completely drunk during most of the trial? I think they wouldn't really say that, but, but that's, that's what they do. They ask you, uh, but isn't the First Amendment implicated? You know, or whatever. They'll bring something out that's in your brief or in opposing counsel's brief, and they'll ask you questions about it. Well, what about uh, you know Sullivan versus New York Times? You know they'll ask you about case law. How is that different from this? And you don't really have that much time to argue. Arguing an appeal is really a completely different skill set. You have to have different writing skills. You have to have a, you got to have more poise, and you have to be differential to these judges because if you have a adversarial tone with these judges or a non-respectful, you're going to get you're going to be done. I mean, so it really is, you're in a high court, and you have to show the high court respect, uh, just like you, sh- like you really should show the district court some respect. And uh, I think when I was younger, um, I let things get to me more than I do now. And in fact, I love when, it, when opposing counsel goes off, and I just sit there quietly and eat their lunch. That is just oh, like a delicious dessert when that happens, because... It doesn't work with a jury, and it doesn't work with the judge. And all you're doing is maybe showing off for your client. And if it doesn't serve your client, don't fucking do it. So it'll be interesting to see where it goes. I think this judge was incredibly thorough. I think that both sides had all their opportunities. And here's the other thing. And here's the other thing that, that, you know, like you have a presumption of innocence in a criminal case. Well, when you file your appeal... And you make your motions and you make your arguments. They take your arguments in a light most favorable to the non-moving party. What does that mean? That means given all things equal, they look, try to look at it and, and give every inference favorable to Johnny Depp on the appeal. So you don't, you don't get the benefit of any kind of presumptions on appeal because the jury has, has – Jury's verdict is going to be respected by the Court of Appeals, and the judge has broad discretion to make evidentiary rulings, and it's usually only where the judge has uh, exceeded her authority and something so clearly erroneous. I just didn't see that happening during, and I watched quite a bit of that trial. The judge seemed like she was incredibly fair, that she took her time with rulings, gave everybody a chance to argue, and the judges have what they call an abundance of discretion. And the Court of Appeals is not going to, absent some kind of abuse of uh, discretion, they're not going to disturb it. So we'll see what happens. This has been, you know, our look at the recent developments of Amber Heard and her new team that she's assembled. So we'll see you next time here on Criminal Lawyer Reacts. I'm Bruce Rivers. Make sure you subscribe. Like this video if you like it. And, uh, you know, stop yourself snitching. And we'll see you next time here on Criminal Lawyer Reacts. Bruce Rivers just broke down your case He know all the charges that you about to face You ain't coming home till 2058 That self snitching gon' get you put away Bruce Rivers just broke down your case He know all the charges that you about to face You ain't coming home till 2058 That self snitching gon' get you put away